I had a question for everybody to, to ask you whether you knew what the the um, hymn for Christendom is. Does anybody know that Christendom actually has a hymn? <laughs> I didn't even know. Okay, right, now my alarm goes off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing no answers. Nobody knows that there's a, a hymn. I, I would guess a mighty fortress is our God. Good guess. It's wrong, but good guess. <laughs> I am going to share it. It's Next. in Paul's letter. Well, that's a good, that's another good guess, but also incorrect. I thought it was. I went looking for it when I read my chapter, but that is not it. So I'm, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to share with you our current hymn of Christendom. And then after that, we're going to compare it to Paul's hymn, which is in our chapter. So let me just go to the next. Here it is. Next slide. Come on, Jane. Next slide. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and I'll play it real quick. Oh, <laughs> I'm not good at this. Okay, so they call this the National Anthem of Christendom, and it was written in 1779, and I wanted to compare a little bit of the language, because the whole point of chapter three for us is that it's, going, it's taking us through kind of the evolution of Christian, Christianity and the thought of who Jesus was, okay? So as we see him now, um, we say all, how, all hail his power, that he is like a king, bring forth the royal diadem, and he was ransomed for us. So we are, we are now ransomed. We're the seed of Israel's race, so now we are ransomed from the fall. So, and by his grace, okay? So what the, what the hymns we now talk about in, Christ, in Christendom is that Jesus was our savior. He died for us. We are ransomed from the fall of Adam because of his grace, because of what he did for us. And the interesting thing about that, about that Christianity of who we are today as Christians was not there um, really for the first three centuries. So what I'm going to go through today is the first and second century and pretty much what Paul, what Mark, and then what John were saying, and then a little bit of, a, of the different influences that were in the world at that time. I don't know if you guys remember Hellenistic, the word Hellenistic was the Greek civilization time period was when, when um, you had the Romans, of course, but then you also had the Greeks influencing all of the religions and all the civil civilization during this Hellenistic time. And so what we'll see today is how the, um, the Greek philosophers and all the different religions and, and um, 
like even during Constantine's time, how the religions were kind of all getting along with each other. And one of the things that the, that the Roman Caesars said was, as long as you don't bother us and our gods, we won't bother you and yours. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a very, um, I guess I would call it prolific period of, of different religions. But then Christianity comes along and that's what we're going to talk about. So we've got, we've got um, Jesus in Paul's hymn. It's Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11. And I'll let you, I don't know if you've had time to read through it a little bit there. But I just wanted to point out a couple of the words that he used it. So um, he is in the form of God, equal with God. It is not robbery to be equal with God. And then he made himself a servant in the likeness of man, humbled himself, obedient. God exalted him. It, it's important to to see that it was God who exalted him, gave him a name above names. So in this sense, he's kind of, he, you know, he's a king. Let me see what, I'll tell you what the author says of him. Just give me not go to the next one. He's a king of kings. Um, Mark talks about him being a perfectly normal man. There's no virgin birth story in the book of Mark. Um, doesn't mean that they didn't believe it at that time, but remember Mark, they believe was written first and that was 70 CE in the common era. That was about uh, 40 years after his death. So there was a question of who was Jesus. And some people thought that he was a disciple of John the Baptist who may have been in a scene uh, he was definitely one of these ascetics. If, if anybody has ever watched any movies about John the Baptist, he always has the wild hair and he's running around, you know, complaining about purifying yourself. <laughs> and so Jesus was baptized by him. And that was part of the ascetic belief is that you needed purification by baptism. And they did talk about in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so there's a lot of son of gods. And then um, later we'll see son of man, but we don't have, we don't have him as a God. We have him equal to God in the early Christian belief systems. We don't have him an actual God because at that time we wanted to have just mm -hmm. one God um that's let's remember this is monotheism so what do you do with a guy that comes along who is the son of god the the concept of the trinity did not develop until like the third century we'll see it in the very next chapter as a matter of fact the council of nicene and so um we do have the spirit of god in mark we've got you know that beautiful verse where he comes out of the waters and the dove descends upon him. And then the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. But our author thinks that this is more along the lines in this early first century of Christianity, where the rabbis um, kind of had this experience that she called, I, I don't exactly know how to pronounce it, but qua where it's the daughter of the voice is the, is the actual um, translation. And it basically means that the, the rabbis were getting inspired by God. Um, and it was this inspiration, like the spirit, like this spirit that, that's in this chapter of Mark, rather than the prophetic revelations like Moses got, you know, where it's the fire talking. So I, I don't see a lot of, I mean, there, it's kind of nuances here and, and, when I was reading this chapter, I think that it's all kind of open to interpretation. But Karen Armstrong talks about, and I think, and a lot of the other scholars do, I kind of checked up on her. You know, a lot of the other scholars were saying that, you know, there was, a, there was still a question of whether Jesus was actually the God figure in this time. He's definitely the son of God. He's definitely the Messiah. Let me give you some more definitions here. And, and they use the word incarnation. 
um, that was different than other religions. He was the incarnation of the absolute. I don't know if you guys, I think we had it last chapter, but they talk about the absolute a lot in this chapter. The absolute would be the unknowable God, this, this uh, inexhaustible reality of God. And Christianity had only the um, Christ as the one um, incarnation of God. And that was actually very different from the other religions. That was different from the Roman religions of the multiple gods. And then it was also different from Buddhism and Hinduism, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this was between 53 and 70 CE. So we're, we're kind of evolving where he is, the incarnation of God, um, the only mediator between humankind and God. But um, but he also said, and you guys all remember the scripture that that he said that we all can have his powers. You know, he when he was talking to his disciples, he said, you know, you will have. I think I actually have the scripture. Yeah. So back down at the bottom of this, of this one, Gospels give Jesus divine power and transfiguration. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. But the divinity of Christ wasn't developed yet. It was Jesus's powers that shone through to transfigure him. That came later in the fourth century. So in this century, he's the, he's the Messiah. He's the charismatic faith healer. He's the new Moses. He's divine wisdom. That wisdom word, which is Sophia, was used a lot about him. And um, then there were times about uh, he was the great teacher, the great tutor. Let me go back to. Um, sorry, I'll get the hang of this. John. The book of John was written about 100 in CE. And that's when we talked about Jesus was in the, be in the beginning was the word. That's, that's, Jesus, that's John's famous phrase. And the word, once again, symbolized in, in early um, times that that was Jesus, but it was more like wisdom. It wasn't quite yet this... Uh, original plan that he had um but it was his powers and his wisdom that were derived from god and existing from the beginning so there's there's a lot of speculation about you know what some of this language was um in that first century you know because because what karen armstrong does is that she takes she takes other writings. You know, there's a lot of writings before and after um, Jesus's death, you know, so she's trying to understand who the Jews were at that time, who the other religions were at that time. And, and there just, there was definitely this monotheistic um, belief system, but it was almost blasphemous to say that Jesus would have been another God because that would be going back in the Jewish faith and even in the early Christian faith, that would have been going back to multiple gods. So when they, when they say in the beginning was the word, Karen Armstrong believes that that meant more along the lines of his powers and the wisdom were derived from God, which were, from, which were um, the word, so. Sorry, I'm going a lot faster here. Anybody, anybody want to throw a question in while we're talking? You gotta, you gotta speak up. So Jesus called himself the son of man a lot in the scripture, and that's an Aramaic phrase. And I thought it was interesting that um, Jesus emphasized his own frail human body. And that, and and to me, that was significant in that whole sense of who was Jesus. You know, it was it 
you know, eventually Christianity would believe that God came down in human form. And I think it was Jesus telling everybody, I am human. You know, I am, I have this frail body just like you. But then that transfiguration is what Jesus, what God can do for you. I think, you know, if we, we, we've had a lot of lessons on what Jesus taught us and he taught a lot about, you know, here's what you can do also to become sons and daughters of God. So I, I think at this time in the first century, it was, it was more along the lines of him as that great teacher. And he was trying to teach us that we could do what he could do. You know, I got that a lot from Jesus's teachings. So and Jane, um, go ahead. Well, what about where it says, Jesus says, and you'll do even greater things than, than I have done to his disciples. Yeah, and that's the one, that's the one I was thinking. So if he's saying that to people, you, you will do even greater things, then that means that we can all be like him, in my mind. It means that, you know, all of these powers, this divine power that he has, that the, that the gospels talk about, you know, the healing, is he a healer? Is he a charismatic faith healer? You know, all the miracles, you know, Jesus said, you can do these things, you know, even more than what I can do. And we, there's been a lot of interpretations about what that has meant. But in this first century, I do think that they, they were thinking along the lines of, you know, Jesus's divine power was from God, but that didn't make him a God separate from the ultimate reality, the one, the, um, the, the God with a capital G kind of a thing. Yeah, his power was a derived power. Correct. It's what, it's what this, the way it reads in the book. Yeah, right, exactly. It was derived from the one. And so could ours be derived from the one. So I thought it was interesting that some people may have thought that he was a Pharisee. That was a new one on me. And I do think the reason why there is that speculation is because he, you know, I mean, we've even got the scripture where he was speaking with the Pharisees at age 12. He was, there were some, like, if you think of Mark, who doesn't have the, the, the Mark doesn't have the virgin birth story. And so, you know, Jesus never wrote anything himself. So there's, there's a question about whether he was even literate, you know, and so the people who were living in that first century may have thought okay here's this carpenter talking to all the pharisees what's the deal with him how does he have this power and that maybe maybe that was this prodigy guy that comes along and he's able to rigorously debate um the pharisees in this school they called the shammai you know he was he was obviously very devoted to the torah we've got most of his his lessons are kind of teaching his disciples how to read the Torah, how to um, have a kind of a new interpretation of the Torah. So he really thought kind of like a Pharisee, if you think of the Pharisees in the kind and gentle way, rather than the, you know, un unfortunately in Christianity, the Pharisees ended up getting kind of a bad name because they went against him and he was always chastising them. But our author says, well, wait a minute, you know, part of that chastisement that he gave was also just this, this Jewish rigorous debate school of thought that they had always had. So I don't know. Is it, I don't think he had the power of a Pharisee from any scriptures that I read, but maybe he had that, that same um, thought process as a Pharisee. So that was one of the kind of questions. Our author asks a lot of questions, which I kind of like, you know. Um, so this is that scripture you were talking about, Dennis. If you have faith as a grain of, of a mustard seed, you shall say it to this mount, remove hence to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. I, I think there's more, but that was the one that kind of caught my eye that he's telling, he's telling his disciples 
if you cultivate an inner attitude of surrender and openness to God, you too can do all of these things. And um, he was telling them that it, it wasn't about adapt, adopting a correct theology. It was about this inner attitude of surrender and openness, which I think was, was kind of his unique spirituality that he was trying to have people go within. And then we'll talk more a little bit about that with how people interpreted that. You know, he was like Paul, he was not, he did not think the spirit was just for the, the elite. You know, he was the, he was the one that was going and hanging out with prostitutes and poor and people that others wouldn't. And, you know, his famous Good Samaritan story. So he was always trying to teach um, that the spirit was for all. And, and Paul caught on to that with his, with his sayings, you know, that, that uh, there's no Jew and no Gentile, there's no male and no female, there's no master and no slave. That's Paul's talking to what our author called the God-fearers. These are the, the Gentile sympathizers to J Judaism. And it's all, they're all living in this Hellenistic time period. And, they, and she called it even a Hellenistic Judaism where there was a tolerance between the Greeks and the Jews and other cultures at this time. And, the, and we're still in the, in the very first century of Christianity. Um, I wanted to point out the golden rule because um, there's actually probably the golden rule is in every religion, you know, somehow. But I really liked learning about this guy, Hillel the Elder, who actually was a Pharisee. You'll look at the time that he lived. And there's a story of him. Um, there was a prospective convert who asked him to explain the whole Torah while he stood on one foot, <laughs> kind of trying to trick him. And uh, Hillel said to him, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is just explanation, which I kind of liked. And it goes right along with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, and the golden rule, if you, if you, if you study the golden rule, it, it's in almost every religion. And I, I think that's kind of significant in terms of, um, I think we talked last week about the axial age. This is a kind of a time when there was, there was a turning point in religious thought. And I think this golden rule became a part of that turning point. So Jesus was the incarnation of God. He was the son of God, um, but he was not yet God incarnate. Okay. So what our author talked about is that, that other religions had incarnations. The Buddhists the Buddhists called them bodhisattvas and the Hindu, Hindus called them avatars. I put this picture up here because I don't know how many have been to the Nelson Art Gallery lately, but that was uh, actually one of my favorite statues. I've tried to draw it a couple of times. That is in the Nelson Art Gallery and that is an example of a bodhisattva. Somebody tell me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. So when Buddha, when Buddha died, what the Buddhists believe is that he reached nirvana. And that meant, he meant you know, remember Buddha, Buddha started as a Hindu. And so when, when Buddha died, he reached, he had already reached nirvana. And that meant that he didn't have to be reborn anymore. So they called it, um, he had become the realization of this absolute that, that we keep talking about that, you know, God in one language, absolute in another language, the inner essence of all things, it, and he no longer existed. But the Buddhists didn't know what to do with that. So they, they um, kind of created these statues and different of different people. And you can see from the different bodhisattvas that um, are in, if you Google them, they were people that that actually put off their own nirvana journey to help others attain a, a enlightenment. And so they were expressing nirvana 
and their devotion to Buddha in numerous forms. So these bodhisattvas became the people that, that those are all the statues. There's Buddha statues too, but at first they didn't actually create Buddha statues. They, it was these intermediaries, these bodhisattvas that were helping people reach nirvana. And in that sense, that's kind of, Jesus, remember, is the, is the mediator. And so that's this comparison. Hindus then, um, Brahman was the unattainable God. That's the, that's the essence that, you know, no one can define kind of a thing. That's the God figure in the, in the sky. But the Hindus then developed a trinity of what they called avatars, and so that's these lesser gods, uh, Shiva, the paradoxical deity of good and evil, and Vishnu, who was kind and, pay and playful, as symbols of Brahman. And so once again, the Hindus could, could worship the, um, the avatars, and that they were that link between God, the unknowable, and humanity. You needed a link in in um, the the religious world so these the first century jews also thirsted for this divine imminence that word imminence means indwelling so that the humanity part of it they needed to to connect with this transcendent god that nobody could understand and so <clears throat> that's where paul's teachings come in that Jesus had replaced the Torah as God's principal revelation to the world. And um, in Acts 17, 28, he says, for in him, in Christ, we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets has said, we are also his offspring. So we all know about the scriptures by Paul about the church is the body of Christ. And so this slide is talking about the different religions and having intermediaries. You know, they had the avatars to, to uh, understand the unknowable God. But the difference was, was that the Buddhists and the Hindus thought that there were many different expressions of, um, of God. And so there will, were multiple avatars and multiple bodhisattvas where the difference in Christianity, which ended up stirring up trouble, was that the, Jesus was the only one. It, he was the only incarnation, and that, that became a problem for people. So remember, we've got this Hellenistic world where the, Roman, the Romans were still believing in their old gods, and um, they were saying to the Hindus and to the Buddhists and to the Jews, okay, you can live with us, as long as you don't mess up the status quo kind of a thing. We have our rituals, we have our traditions. Um, this is where um, the Talmud Jews were ejecting these God fearers that, that Paul, remember from our other lessons that Paul did not call himself a Christian. Paul was, uh, what do we call him? A Jesus Jew. <laughs> he was, he was, uh, he believed in Jesus, but he didn't call himself Christian at this point. But he was the one that was saying these, these Gentiles, goyim is another word used, these god fearers should be allowed in, in our fold. And that was different than the Talmud Jews. Um, the problem was that Christianity became a threat to Rome because it would not allow other beliefs. Um, our author talks, and I did want to ask this question to you guys, our author talks about how um, religion is a matter of cult and ritual based on emotion, ideology, and based on emotion, not ide ideology or theory. Okay, so the, remember, this is, this is early Rome, and this is when the Greeks were, Greeks were in, influencing them. So ideology and theory were all the philosophers' purview. And Christianity lacked the antiquity of Judaism and the ritual of paganism. So we, we asked the question, do some people attend religious services for ritual 
and not theology, how do rituals provide us with a link to tradition and security? And are we disturbed when our liturgy, it, liturgy changes? I, I don't think our church has a lot of liturgy, but it does have some. You know, I mean, we have our own traditions. We have our own way of doing a church service. So do we, do we as a people lose our identity if we try to change that liturgy? I kind of wanted to throw that question out to you guys, see what you thought. Any, any takers? I've attended I several different Christian churches that have wrote prayers. And, and to me, that is some um, ritual versus theology. I, when I'm in those churches, I just don't sense that heartfelt prayer that if, if someone is creating the prayer at the moment, that it's it's more from their heart and i don't know if that's where you're headed jane but that that ritual versus yeah. spirit filled uh, definitely some churches have it more than others but we have the lord's prayer that's a ritual for us so, well i think that some churches are more so than others and i know i the uh, Jewish people have a lot of rituals. And uh, right now on my bus route over uh, just off of 87th Street, there's a little Jewish synagogue and, or a Jewish, I guess it's a synagogue. Anyway, they uh, right now is one of their times where they eat outside in the evening. And they set up this little wooden uh, structure that have tables in there and have pictures on it and everything. And, and they gather in the evening for their evening meals there. And that's part of their, their ritual. You know, every year they do this. Uh, so I think a lot of it depends on the church that you attend and what they're rituals are well and i think that there's value in both you know i wouldn't judge you know i mean i do think there are different people who need more ritual than others and i think you know maybe there are times in our lives at christmas time for instance i think we have more ritual than we do at other times and so in this early just you got to think about these early churches you know and kind of what the status quo is and and anything new was kind of disturbing. I I didn't I didn't read one of the quotes, but some guy named Gustav said Christianity is barbaric because it's new. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. You know, it's like some people are like, uh, we don't like anything because it's new, and other people are like, let's change, let's change, let's change. And I think it's important lesson for us to learn in 2021 that 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 kind of issue was from the very beginning of religion, you know? So we're gonna have that tension, you know, at all times. Okay. When uh, Lee and I were first married and we lived out in Wichita one time, uh, I think actually it was David Shobar who happened to be in charge of the service. And we, instead of having the communion service in the sanctuary like normal, uh, they set up tables out in the fellowship hall in the shape of a cross, and everybody was supposed to sit around the table. And one of the ladies just threw a hissy fit because it wasn't done properly. And, you know, it was her ritual that you had to do it in the sanctuary as always. Yeah. And, you know, that had become something that she was hard and fast that you know, this is blasphemous to do it any other way than sitting in the sanctuary. So yeah, there you go. You know, some people accepted it more than others. 
that that is i mean it's just it yeah i just think it was important to to talk about how you know this was happening in the first century and we're still dealing with it today so um, sorry i'm sorry i thought you were done oh, um i think there's a i think that religion or christianity has to have a blending of both and um, what came to mind for me was um, the um, communion. And um, I was always whispering to my kids, remember what this means. You know, think about your la this past month. Is there things that you need to repent? And is there things that you need to try to do better this next, this next month? And um, they go, yeah, yeah, mom, you know, but but, you know, we can get caught up in the rituals and the, there is a place for the rituals because that's the emotion. Maybe. But there's also the there's a place for the um, for the um, theological or whatever, because that's our intellect. And until you have a blending of both. It's not it's not a fulfillment of what God wants it for us. You, he wants the elect intellectual and he does want the emotional. I guess I see rituals as things that bind the congregation together. Uh, we have a whole hymnal full of rituals. When we sing those hymns, we've sung them over and over and over. Uh, when we select scriptures for Christmas or for Easter, we use the same scriptures year after year after year. And those become rituals because we all know them. And uh, there's, a, there's a connection that we have as a congregation when we use those kinds of things. The communion prayers, very ritualistic. We, we don't dare change those. I mean, when the new prayers came out a few years ago, a uh, few people you know, blew their tops off their heads just about because they couldn't see new, using the new prayers. They wanted to use the old prayers. Uh, so there's a lot that's ritualistic, but I think the, the benefit of uh, sometimes having events uh, like uh, Karen was talking about a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, sort of a not a rope prayer, but a prayer that a person prays from their heart. Uh, that's something new and it's refreshing and it helps us to think about things in new ways. So uh, that's kind of what, you know, I, I think Robin was coming from. We have, you need both parts of that. You need both sides. You need the ritualistic side and you need the new side that explores and kind of pushes the boundaries a little bit. And for me, that's what makes church interesting. You know, we have some very predictable things that we're going to do when we gather together on Sundays, but we also have the expectation that uh, new knowledge or new insight is going to be shared with us as well. And, and I like both. I, and, and by the way, that prayer from uh, Philippians, the one from Paul, Jane, uh, that you started with, um, there are some scholars that think Paul didn't write that. Uh, that that actually was a liturgical prayer that was already in existence in the Christian community by the time Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians. That was his last book. That was a very late letter uh, right before his death. And he uh, may have borrowed that and put it into his scripture, into his letter, uh, because it expressed what he wanted to share with the church at Philippi. So it's even older than what Paul was doing. That's Possibly, yeah. Some think that. Yeah. Not not everybody, but there's some some thought yeah. that that's the case. They called it they called it uh, Paul's hymn, which was yeah. interesting. Yeah. So it's attributed to him because that's where it first showed up. But the the yeah. book of Philippians is actually a collection of of pieces of of letters of Paul, um, and and he even says in Philippians, I think we learned this when we talked about it um he wrote it with timothy and possibly also with silas so it's actually three different people that have contributed to to one letter um, and then that particular passage was was possibly something that the church was already using at that time well that makes sense because a lot of his letters were written while he was in prison you know so he's remembering what he was doing with those churches you know he's writing exactly, to yeah. churches Jane, could I add something here? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, um, what we're talking about uh, raises in my uh, thought uh, reference back to uh, the inspired version of the book of Genesis. And I'd like to read just uh, several of the verses there from uh, chapter six, because it addresses what we're talking about if it doesn't uh, so, so I'll just bear with me if I uh, read this here. Uh, 
And it came to pass when the Lord had spoken with Adam, our father, that Adam cried unto the Lord, and he was caught away by the spirit of the, of the Lord, and was carried down into the water, and was laid under the water, and was brought forth out of the water, and thus he was baptized. And the Spirit of God descended upon him, and thus he was born of the Spirit, and he became quickened in the inner man. And he heard a voice out of heaven saying, Thou art baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost. This is the record of the Father and the Son from henceforth and forever. And thou art after the order of him who is without beginning of days and end of days from all eternity to all eternity. Behold, thou art one in me, a son of God, and thus may all become my uh, sons. Amen. It seems to me that that uh, addresses uh, to some extent uh, the question that you've raised there. Thank you. That, yeah, thank you, Jerry. That's the evolution uh, in our own religion of belief, because that's Genesis and that's the, you know, the Joseph's translation is what it is, what our inspired version is sometimes called. That's Joseph taking those same scriptures. And now the interpretation is that Adam was baptized and in the, in there in the beginning. So there's, I mean, it just, it just fascinates me that, that, uh, even, you know, even Christianity, and we've, we've often said this in our own religion that, that the beliefs have have continued to evolve, you know. So, um, in that sense, Adam doesn't need necessarily have the fall anymore, which was always kind of a theology that was a little difficult for our religion. We never really thought that that you know babies had to be baptized and things like that, like some religions do. So I think that goes right along with that. You know, so thank you, Jerry. That's interesting evolution there. Somebody tell me what this picture is. It's been up for a while. Do you guys, rem you guys know? Anybody? I'm going to go to the next slide. Plato's Shadows in the Cave. Yay! Plato's Shadows of the Cave. Plato is a fascinating dude. He was actually, he lived in 428 or 427 to 348 or 347. So we're talking about three centuries before our early Christian, you know, this, this, this first century, you know, this new religion thing that we're talking about today. And yet he was a huge influence on people. He was an influence on the pagans because they were intellectuals that were these greek intellectuals that were saying that christianity they called it barbaric <laughs> and they they said it was too much um too much emotion there wasn't enough intellectualism and what i didn't realize about plato was he he actually did believe in god you know and and his god was was once again it, it was it was actually defined in aristotle's work as the unmovable mover and so the 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 god of the philosophers is once again this they call him the one this pure being this eternal form which animates the sun the stars and the moon but the philosopher thought that that he could ascend to the one on his own by his own efforts, and, and it was all this rational, ordered methodology kind of a thing. They thought Christians were ir irrational, that God would intervene when he, what didn't, where he didn't belong, according to the, 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 um, the philosophers. And so there was this tension in this first century where a lot of them said, well, intelligent men... <laughs> I thought that was funny. The intelligent men believed in philosophy, and it was it was the not so intelligent that one of the emotional, you know, religious experience. So that's kind of this tension again: philosophers versus Christians in this in this early Christian world. So then the apologists come along, and the apologists, as you remember, are the people who defend the Christian faith. And I really liked, as I'm studying this, I kind of went back and um, I've got a nephew 
who's in a, a, a very conservative religion, he calls himself an apologist. And so I had to go study what that meant. <laughs> and some more recent um, apologists in our history are, I don't know if you guys have read the book by Lee Strobel, called The Case for Christ. That's a, that's a big apologist. I think he's a lawyer even. And so it's people who are defending the faith you know, against the other religions to show why Christianity is the way to go. C.S. Lewis was a big um, apologist. And so the first one was this guy, Justin of Caesarea, the, the martyr. They call him the, Justin the martyr, 100 to 165. And he was trying to tell the, um, the philosophers that, Chris, that, that Christians were actually following Plato because Plato believed in one God and so did the Christians. And then he was trying to say that the Greek philosophers and the Jewish prophets foretold the coming of Christ. And, and that he used this word logos, which is, the, which is the reason and knowledge. If Jesus is logos, then that's what the philosophers were talking about too, reason and knowledge. So therefore, if you're talking about logos, logos, then you're then you're talking about Christ coming. So he was trying to kind of blend the philosophers with the Christianity to say there isn't that much of a difference. And then he also was talking about how there were parallels, you know, in Christian um, um, stories to pagan mythology. And so um, he was beheaded you know, unfortunately, and he call, that's why he's called the martyr. And he kind of um, started a lot of the early Christians into thinking martyrdom was the way to go, which is an interesting, you know, part of religious theology. But he was arguing with this pagan philosopher named Crescentius, and um, who denounced him and went to the Romans, and basically he got beheaded for it. So this is this is now going into the second century. So, you know, we've got very strong philosophers, we've got strong pagans still, and then we've got these early Christians, these, these converts like Justin trying to kind of blend the two and defend Christianity. So he was the first and he, I don't think he was, well, he wasn't successful contemporarily, but he became, uh, I think he became a saint after a while in the, in the, in the Catholic church, so they liked him later, but he wrote a lot. So what's interesting is that there's a lot of writings now that we get to go to. We've talked a lot about the Gnostics over the years and um, the Gnostics believed that there was, that human beings contain this divine spark. And the interesting thing about the Gnostics, that's this gospel of Thomas that was found in the, in the Nag Hammadi library in Egypt um, in 1945. So it hasn't been that long that we've known about it. And uh, I, did, I put a little side note in there because I love Elaine Pagels and she wrote a book um, about the gospel of Thomas and, <clears throat> and the Gnostic gospels and how the Orthodox church, which is really kind of the church following the belief systems of, of the book of John, just, just crushed the Gnostics. They, they crushed all of the people who were, were um, teaching things other than the, you know, God is, and Jesus Christ, and then, then later the Trinity comes along. And so all of that is the Orthodox, Orthodox Church developing that we'll see a little bit more in the next chapter. But the Gnostics were, were, were more about this inner, this, this um, divine spark within us and that, that God was still that um, unknowable God. And there, there had to be then some of these lesser gods that, that, that created the world because God is still, is still that quiet, uh, deep solitude within and that our way of getting to God is to look inside ourselves and to, to make ourselves the starting point. And then we can find God within ourselves. And there's a lot more to the Gnostics than that, but that it was, it was very different than God and Jesus Christ on the outside, this, 
some people called it this alien being. It, it, it was basically another person who was saving us rather than going within and saving ourselves kind of a thing. And so Gnostics were, were pretty much, you know, stamped out by the, by the young Orthodox Christian church. Same with these guys. I'll go quickly. I know I'm running out of time, but um, Marcion, he wasn't a Gnostic, but a lot of people called him that. He actually believed in this kind of two God system where you had, you had, you had the one, the transcendent God that nobody could know, but then you also had the Jewish, you had the Jewish create who created um, the world. And that's the tribal, you know, jealous deity that we see in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Jesus was the incarnation of God. Marcion thought Paul was the only true apostle of Christ. And Marcion was the first person who actually created a canon of scripture, which is kind of interesting because because I think it was in reaction to him that Christians later created the scriptures. To, uh, his canon of scripture only had the had ten Pauline epistles and then a shorter version of, of the Gospel of Luke, which is kind of interesting. Um, Clement was another um, um, apologist, and he was kind of once again he he started out as a philosopher, and so he was he was trying to reconcile the two again. And I thought it was kind of funny that he said that once again, this unknowable God is this quietness within and that Christians should imitate him. For example, Christians should burp gently. <laughs> so like the quieter we are within ourselves, the closer we can get to God and then he can, he can become our, the divine companion. Um, but then he also called Jesus Logos. And um, Jesus was the full participation in divine reason. So if we go back to who Plato was, you know, was all about reason and thought, what Clement was saying was that Jesus is one step further, that he was the full participation of divine reason. He was the word. He was the tutor that um, taught us to act morally and control his passions. And most of Clement's work actually kind of compared the Homer teachings from the philosophers with Jesus. So I thought that was interesting that he, you know, were, it was a lot of these pagan philosophers who were now getting converted to Christianity. So then um, once again, another, another apologist is Origen versus, and then Celsus was the, was the Greek philosopher that thought that the Bible, um, he basically said no self-respecting philosopher of the platonic tradition would ever be so stupid to become Christian. Origen took issue with that and was saying that they really are compatible. You know, the Bible contains greater wisdom than Greek philosophers, Greek philosophers could ever grasp. And so he was kind of this Christian platonic belief person. So once again, it's our early Christian fathers who who grew up as pagans, who grew up as, you know, in the, this Greek philosophy world, and they are now able to say, wait a minute, Christianity does have wisdom, Christianity and philosophy are compatible. So, um, so uh, Karen Armstrong thought that origin uh, raised Christianity to a level of academic respectability. She wasn't too keen on, on Justin the Martyr. She thought that he didn't grasp the concepts well enough, but she does think that now, now the debate is becoming more academic and more respectable. So she talks about that, you know. Oh, and Origen may or may not have castrated himself. <laughs> so that was kind of a funny little story. It became a big rumor. And then he said at the end, that he didn't. And so I never really read that scripture. It, it was in Matthew 19, 12, where it says that um, there are people who make themselves unit for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And it actually is in Matthew. And so some people thought he took that literally and castrated himself, but he denied it later. So 
I thought that was kind of interesting. So here we are at the end of the second century and this guy named Plotinus, is that how you pronounce him? I'm not sure how to pronounce him. But now we've got Neoplatonism. And we, the interesting thing about this guy, look at the time that he lived, 205 to 270. He did not call himself a Christian. He thought it was objectionable, like a lot of the Greek philosophers. But he actually kind of penned the concept of the Trinity. Now, remember, the philosophers actually did believe in God. And so we have the one which is unknowable. And then in his trinity, we also had the intellect and then we had the soul. So in his mind, knowledge was intuitive. And, and so it, it was actually something that kind of, um, you're on a spiritual quest for knowledge. And then that presence of the unknowable becomes a part of you. And it's the soul it's the soul that brings them all together. The soul brings them into unity. I liked, I liked the um, description that our author put together that, that the soul is kind of the worker bee that if, if you picture a choir standing around a conductor and, they're, and you're really concentrating on him. So human beings standing around our conductor and we're really concentrating on him then the whole community sings as they ought to be really with him. So that is how we participate with the absolute if we as a group can concentrate. So, so this God that, that Plotinus is talking about is our best selves. And we can refashion our own world by our souls doing this work of finding the underlying truth. I, I like his language. I mean, it, you look at his language and it's basically what Christians believe oh. about the Trinity. You know, I mean, this is what the Trinity, God, Jesus Christ and the spirit says to us. It, it's, it's our souls that kind of do that work to understand Christ within and, and who God is in our lives. And Plotinus was thinking about this in kind of this philosopher viewpoint. So Christianity, it's coming into its own, um, it's coming in, into its own, and it's it's comparing God's presence to this same state of mind that's in philosophy, and then also nirvana. So I liked this question that our author kind of put together: When human beings contemplate the absolute, so when human beings are contemplating God, do they have very similar ideas and experiences? You know, because even though there's a lot of differences between these religions we've talked about today, there's also this kind of this yearning for making God um, human, you know, relatable, so to speak. And so we see this evolution of all the religions making God relatable. And that's what Christ did for us. That's what Christ did for Christianity. So is that is that something that that you guys can kind of get on board with with do all of the religions when they're co contemplating the absolute have similar ideas and experiences or is that too foreign for us? Anybody want to tackle that question? That makes sense or does that make sense what I'm talking about? I think we're talking about kind of that axial age again. Karen Armstrong believes very strongly that, you know, the religions were all kind of their own, having their own upheavals. So when we're talking about Buddhism, you know, the, the Buddha figured out how to have nirvana on his own, but but he also went and and um, taught others. So there has to be humanity with religion, and it could it can't be like the old gods where, you know, there you know it was just either so too scary or too unknowable. I mean, I think that human beings crave knowing God, 
And even today we have, we have this dichotomy of God is unknowable, but on the other hand, we have a personal relationship with God. And I do think that's a concept that is probably in every religion. It's, it's in human nature to want to understand God. That's how, that's how I look at that question. I think that, that uh, that's why we're kind of told to draw apart and, you know, uh, spend time in prayer and such is so that we can contemplate that. And so we can kind of figure out where our place is in relation to God and where he is in relation to our lives. Uh, we have to make that connection with the one-on-one. -on -one. Right. We crave, we, ca we crave that personal connection. But then if you actually ask somebody who is God, you know, he's unknowable. I mean, he, he created universes. He, there isn't any way to know who God is because we're, because of our human intellect can't figure it out. So it really is still today, this dichotomy of, of it, it's both, it's unknowable and it's a craving for relationship. And I think that's, to me, that's what religion is. That is trying to figure out these two competing interests. You know, I mean, it, it, <laughs> I kind of like that about religion is that nobody really knows any answers. So we keep trying, you know, <laughs> that's how I look at religion. I, I think I there's think you, the, I, you know, closeness when you have camp and reunion because you you are drawing away from the worry, worries of the outside world for a while and you're concentrating on God and on relationships with each other and with yourself and God. So yeah, I think you, that's what the real power of camps for youth and for adults are, yeah. are is drawing that drawing back to God. Yeah, that quietness, getting that quietness, that solitude again. A lot of people talk about that. Paul? I, yeah, Jane, I, I have absolutely no academic or scholarly precedent for what I'm about to say. But I think... <laughs> I, so, so, so that's my disclosure. This is just something that I believe. I, I, I believe that the human condition uh, is so scary sometimes, and the, the world is such a big place and an unpredictable place and a random place that it's a fundamental human need that we have uh, to be able to explain the universe in terms of something that is greater than we are. I, I hope that there's a God out there because I don't know how we get out of this thing on our own. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? It does. And I think, I think it kind of harks back to what we've been talking about in the earlier chapters of God, you know, I mean, trying to explain the world around us, trying to, trying to, to quell our own fears, so to speak, you know. Yeah, and, I, and I think that's the answer to the question I think that you had on the previous slide. Uh, you know, we, we all hope that somebody's in charge. We hope that we're not in charge. We hope somebody else is in charge because we don't do a very good job when it's us. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we certainly hope for something better and uh, trust that there's something better and bigger and more responsible than we are. That's my personal feeling. And that's, that's the one thing that I think all of humans share in common. And that's probably why uh, there has been this search as long as humans have been able to write things down and record our thoughts uh, about why we're looking for God and how we're trying to understand God and the universe. That, that's my thought. Yeah. And it, it, I, I, go, I go beyond that a little bit more, Paul, because I see the evolution in our world of, um, you know, both reason, you know, you think about the, the philosophers that were still studying Plato now, and then also science, you know, I mean, I think, you know, speaking to a scientist, <laughs> I think that science is still so open of a, you know, of a world that there are so many things that scientists don't understand. And so when I think of God, I think of this unknowable thing, you know, that scientists are desperately trying to understand for whatever purposes. Sometimes it's just this thirst for knowledge. I like that. I like that, you know, the intellect in us 
thirsts for knowledge and scientists are trying to fig, trying to explain them and some have decided to explain that there is no god and then others are are explaining of how god and, and you know and science are compatible you know so so to me it's just this fascinating human condition of trying to explain what we don't understand you know and i think that is part of what religion is so I just wanted to, you know, throw up here for what the next chapter is going to be. And we got Constantine the Great, who comes in and he's the one that legalized Christianity. And there's some question about why some people think he did it just so he could win this battle, <laughs> which I think is kind of funny. And then uh, the Council of Nicaea is going to be important because that's when the Nicene Creed came and that's when there really was this beginning of the Trinity, this beginning of, of the, the, the orthodox um, viewpoint of Christians. Um, so basically the orthodox church is just kind of getting rid of all of the people that weren't believing like them, the Gnostics, the Marcionites that we talked about, this guy Montanus, he kind of went backwards and thought that everybody should be martyrs and so they, he went back to the concept of like in Ball's time where there had to be human sacrifices. And he actually converted a lot of people away from Christianity because Christianity was going towards this, you know, gentler, you know, quiet God. And that didn't that didn't work well for Montanus. But the Orthodox Church came along and kind of wiped them out, too. But a lot of people in the third century, as we'll see, liked Christianity. They liked the welfare system that it, it created. You know, that's kind of this compassion of Christ thing and how compassionate they were towards each other. And I like how um, our author talks about it appealed to more intelligent men now because the apologists were finally getting to them. And then women, this is, this is of course, a, a little bit of a controversy for us because Jesus, uh, Paul did write there's no no male or female, no Jew or Gentile. And so the women kind of liked that Paul's teachings and they were joining the Christians. So I'll, I'll finish with this question that Karen kind of disturbed me with this question. Karen Armstrong thought that Christian Christianity is a religion of adversity and it's never been at its best in prosperity. That, that question threw me. I know I don't know if I agree or disagree with it. I just think it's it's kind of a head scratcher that I wanted to leave you guys with. <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting. Okay. You know, she's the one that said that Christians started out pleading for toleration of their views, which were new. And right. then once they became more accepted or more well known as we'll see in the next chapter and so on, they demand conformity to their point of view. And, you know, we're talking about trying to understand an unknowable God, and yet so often religion seems to think they can nail down exactly what it is, and everybody has to believe that. And we've got it all figured out, and we don't have it all figured out. Yeah. I, I think religion needs to have the curiosity of a scientist to continue to want to know more about what this unknowable is. Well, and, and maybe she was talking about that, Sharon, that when Christianity became a part of the Roman Empire, you know, I mean, it yeah. was it was very orderly and it became administratively easy to kind of combine the Roman empire and the Christian empire, so to speak, you know, all the popes that come, come later, it became exactly what, you know, the early Christians were battling against, you know, so maybe that's what she's saying when it doesn't do well in prosperity, because it's now the accepted religion, but now it's become the oppressed group. You know, yeah, I, I think that's exactly what she's saying, Jane. I think when the church under the Roman Empire became incredibly wealthy, which they did, um, the church leadership, the hierarchy fell uh, subject to the same temptations that everybody else falls to when when things are going really, really well. We, you know, we do better when we're challenged. Uh, we don't do very well when we're when we're doing well. <laughs> 
Well, well, people look to God when they're having problems. They don't look to him when they're having uh, success. Yeah. Well, you know, it, that, it is an interesting concept whenever a religion gets too big, you know. I mean, all of a sudden it becomes more rigid and, and looking inward and not looking at, you know, the concepts that Jesus was actually trying to teach, you know, that it appealed to those Romans way back in the first century because of its compassion, you know, and its humanity. And I think, that, you know, for sure, the Roman Empire lost its humanity. We can all agree on that. But, you know, we have to be careful in our world now that we don't lose our humanity, because that's what the core of Christianity was that Jesus taught. And I think that's maybe a warning from from our author a little bit. So all right, people, thank you. I know I talked fast. We did we did it. 